Hi, I'm Wayne Cabot, and the story of 9-11 is a story that is still being written. It's a story that's 20 years old, and to this day, the story of how it was told is really telling when we hear the voices that morning and how we took all kinds of information that was very disparate, very hard to nail down, and put together the information that people were were really trying to find out that morning. It was a desperate city, as we all remember. Maybe those of us who were not around then would want to hear how we covered it and how New York struggling for answers found them. Uh, right here from a crew of people who were so dedicated and so somehow calm throughout all of this when really hell was breaking out all around the city of New York. We have reassembled that crew. Tom Kaminsky was over the Hudson River. He was in the chopper when he saw that flash of the fireball when the first plane hit. Sean Adams was literally running from a crumbling building. And Sean Adams was, I see these guys there now. Hello, gentlemen. Sean Adams yeah. was was on the phone while he was running, reporting what was going on. Listening back to what happened that morning uh, cements to us just how historical that was and and tells us that all these years later, it can be painful and numbing to think back, but it's also very instructive when we think about the fact that really is this was the record of history being written. Let's welcome that team that was there that morning. We are so glad we can uh, reunite the morning anchors that day. And that would be Pat Carroll and Jeff Kaplan back together again. Pat, hello. Good morning to you. Good morning, Wayne. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you and hear you. And your radio partner from 20 years ago. Hello, Jeff Kaplan. Welcome from Salt Lake City. It's good to have all you guys here. And we're going to bring in Sean and, and Tom in just a second. But you were the two who were anchoring that morning. And you know information was so hard to discern in those first few hours. TV got knocked off the air. Cell service was down or very spotty. All of New York turned to the two all-news radio stations hoping for the answers. I mean, the first responders clearly had us on. Everybody had on the news stations trying to find out what was happening. Many of us heard the audio that morning already. We've heard the clips that have been played. Uh, many have not. This is not so much a retrospective of the clips as it is a big view of that morning from those who lived it uh, minute by minute. Pat, uh, let's start with you. That blur of information that morning, what stays with you? It was a relentless pace. When I looked at the timeline to prepare for this conversation, it was every five minutes, you know, there was a new horrifying development or less. And, and we were just flying by the seat of our pants. We, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just reacting. We were almost doing a play by play of this horrible experience for everyone else. And you really did feel um, a responsibility and, and that you had a role to play because, as you say, everyone needed what we were providing that day. Jeff, you too brought us the initial terrifying breaking news uh, that morning. When did it sink in? When did you allow yourself to absorb what was happening? Um, afterwards, like long afterwards, right? Yeah. Um, uh, my recollection was I had gone to get some coffee during commercials. Uh, was coming back with the coffee and our producer said, yeah, there's something going on at the World Trade Center. And I said, hey, what's that smoke? Are they doing construction at the Lincoln Tunnel? And I'm looking out the window. And that's when Tommy came on the air from the helicopter and said, something's going on here at the World Trade Center. And, and from there, it's like kind of all your broadcast training kicks in. There, you're not saying anything that you could possibly believe. How could this be happening? But you know, it comes in your ear and you regurgitate it on the air. And I think that's all we did the entire morning. It also, there were cameras on the scene, even though um, things got knocked out at times. So we could watch. I mean, we could look out the window from a distance and see smoke, but we could watch and and sort of do the play by play by watching the TV monitors right in the studio, as well as what was coming over the wires and what producers were telling us. And, and it was um, it was just breakneck speed for the next however many hours until at least noon, I think we finally took a breath. Yeah, it was fortunate we were at CBS headquarters doing the show because we had an internal feed where we could see all these different TV monitors from the World Trade Center. I mean, the television channels got knocked off the air, didn't they? 
They did. They did for at least for a brief time. Some of them were, were gone for a long time until they were able to reassemble on the Empire State Building. Right. I want to bring in Tom Kaminsky and then Sean Adams. Uh, Tom, obviously, anybody who's heard the audio, and a lot of us have, and if they haven't, uh, your voice lives on in the 9-11 Museum, all kinds of places. Uh, the audio is uh, countless documentaries. It's on our website. Um, you you were the first person to come on the air with the information, and you were also uh, trying desperately to to get us to get it on the air, literally minutes after it happened. What do you remember? What I remember most distinctly is trying to get a hold of somebody in the newsroom um, because we had just gone to commercial. Uh, Jared Max had just finished his sports report and we had gone into a minute of commercials as, as all of this was going on. And I was calling to the newsroom just to alert somebody that there was indeed something happening at the World Trade Center and I couldn't get a hold of anyone. And as it turned out, everyone was was look at one corner office window, our news director's office, uh, that had a view of lower Manhattan, and that's where everybody was. So I heard Pat intro me, and all I could do was just go on the air with what I saw. And uh, the first words out of my mouth were, something, something has happened at the World Trade Center. Let's play that clip right now if we can. Tom Kaminsky, Chopper 880. All right, uh, Pat, we are just currently getting a look at the World Trade Center. We have something that has happened here. We had seen a fireball, and I can tell you it appears as though something has gone into the World Trade Center. Okay, that's a, that's a, we, we put together a couple different moments. It didn't all happen, that first part and that second part, right? There was a lot of space in between where you were just grasping at really no official information for a very long time. Well, we were trying to get official information. The closest that we had to anything was we were in contact. Uh, our, our pilot uh, at the time had been in contact with the air traffic controllers at LaGuardia Airport. Um, we were at the George Washington Bridge when the first plane, unbeknownst to us, flew right over our heads, uh, which, which was not anything that was all that unusual because occasionally there would be uh, landings at LaGuardia Airport using that approach. So we didn't even think anything of it. Uh, and we had been facing northbound looking for a collision on the Major Deacon Expressway, which we never did find. But that's the reason we were there that late, because this was toward the end of our shift. Uh, um, we turned southbound and started down the Hudson River because we were heading home. We were heading back to Linden Airport. And we saw the flash and the fireball. And my pilot said, I think that was a plane. And I said, are you sure? He goes, I'm not. He said, but I think it might be. And he called LaGuardia Airport. Our designation, our call sign at the time on the aircraft was uh, 8BQ, 8 Bravo Quebec. And he called November 8, uh, 8 Bravo Quebec. Did you guys just lose an aircraft? And we didn't hear anything. And he called him again and said, um, LaGuardia 8BQ, did you just lose one? And all we heard was standby. In the next couple of minutes, we were getting in for some scant information, but our first instinct was to head toward it. And in that 60 to 90 second period, we uh, had gotten about as far as the Lincoln Tunnel and when Pat uh, tossed it to me. From that point, uh, it was just a matter of of describing what we what we saw, and very rapidly, Pat and Jeff began to get phone call. There was phone calls in the newsroom. They were putting eyewitnesses on the air. So this whole thing was it, it was rapidly coming together. At, Mom, at that I remember point. you but stayed. We, we knew we knew we had a situation. you stayed with it probably longer than you should have been still in the airspace, right? I tossed to Craig Allen as I normally would have. And both of you guys had said, stay with me for a second. What else did you see? And I just, uh, and, and I just kept up a running commentary at that point. And at that point, all we knew was that something had hit the world trade center. It could have been a private flyer, somebody who got confused at the controls. Uh, and then 18 minutes later, the second plane hit. And I think we have a little audio putting together some of the events that transpired so quickly after that. Neil? Uh, no, that, was, 
Another Apparently plane. that was another plane. Yes, he hit in building number one. The other building. Yes, he flew right into oh, it. God, this is horrible. It looks like the North Tower of the World Trade Center has just completely collapsed. Where the building once stood, there is nothing but smoke. There is smoke billowing and covering all the surrounding smaller skyscrapers. Pat and Jeff, I, the, Jeff, when you just said there, this is horrible. That was maybe the first time that any editorial uh, word was used. When you think how we all are humans and feel it, even when we're trying to just convey information. Uh, the two of you did such an outstanding job, as so many in, in the media did that morning, really distinguishing yourselves as people who were delivering nothing but the information that we had. And if you didn't know for sure, you you said so. But you were able to somehow push aside the emotion for a very long time. How the heck did you do that? Shock. Yes, Jeff, Just I remember. Shock. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was an automatic sort of instinctive something took over. And all, all yeah. the training, as Jeff had mentioned earlier, all your broadcast training, every breaking news story you ever covered in your whole life, suddenly you realize it was preparing you for this moment and and you just kind of went with it and we all went with it in the newsroom as well the the people talking in our ear and the people working the phones and everybody just went with it as though we had been preparing for this throughout our careers but we did know that we we were important we were necessary so we knew we had to keep going and we i remember trying to kind of reassure people we're all in this together it's bad, but we've got you. We're with you. That was the feeling I had. You know, first I thought it was another day on the job. And and really, you're on autopilot. Sorry, Tommy, but it, it's autopilot where you hear information, you regurgitate the information, you do not think. But it, there were various moments when I would just gasp, and they were small things that other people might not catch as being seismic. Pat, when you mentioned that there was an all call for all firefighters, to head down there. And we know that everybody was listening. There was really no TV at the moment. I mean, we realize now what that means. We were announcing all firefighters go to the World Trade Center. And I think I mentioned to you off air, I've never heard of anything like that. What is all call? Do you remember? I do remember that. I do. Yeah. Because that's a, that's a lot of people in New York City mm. to have an all call. Yeah. Yeah. There were there were phrases that all of us heard that morning that that we never we had never heard before. My my story on that was um, because again we were pretty much out of fuel, so it was our deter our, it was our thought that we were going to go to our old base of operations, which was about uh, six or seven miles north of the trade center. Uh, we knew that they had fuel. Um, we knew the guy that that owned the place, and we had every intention of getting fuel and got fuel we got clearance from LaGuardia uh, from uh, Teterboro Airport and got about 50 feet off the ground and the air traffic controller said uh, 8BQ you guys need to land immediately the airspace has been sterilized and got back down on the ground and our pilot said what was that last thing and he said the airspace has been sterilized and he said um, Teterboro forgive me, but I've never heard that phrase before. What does that mean? And he said, that means nobody's going anywhere. You need to be, you need to land immediately. Um, and you talk, talk about listening to uh, somehow all of our training preparing us. The thing that I find striking whenever I hear any of this audio is that we are all operating on this level right about here. Um, and doing anything possible to center ourselves to folks. The one thing that you can hear in my reporting is that at one point uh, before the second plane comes in, I start talking about traffic. I, because I remember, well, I used to write everything down on a clipboard. I still write everything down, but it's on an iPad now, but I used to write everything down on a clipboard. And I remember looking down at the clipboard and the clipboard was shaking in my hands. And I just, I, I needed to center myself and doing traffic, which I had done for all these years was exactly how I did that. Uh, and I start talking about traffic on West Street and on Canal Street. And I talk about vehicles coming down into this area from every conceivable direction. That was for me. 
that was to center me um, just because we're now that I was familiar with. We were in a completely unfamiliar situation at that point, flying next to this building. Tom, the whole buildings, world uh, and and watching well, everybody listening, everybody reporting on it was in a completely unfamiliar situation. And I think as Sean Adams, let's let's bring in Sean now. Sean, sorry to, to wait so long to bring you to this mix here, uh, because you have a, just an amazing experience. I, you were actually running from one of the buildings that was collapsing. Tell us about that. Well, I was there. I mean, I was on the ground and. Uh, be because of uh, Tom's initial uh, report, uh, I heard it because I was on the phone waiting to go live to do a story and I heard Tom's words and I immediately dropped the phone and started driving. So uh, I got on the FDR and I got behind every flashing light I could to drive as fast as I could. And the whole way down, I listened to uh, Jeff and Pat and Tom and they were giving me the the, the basic information to know what I was walking into. We should also note uh, one of our former producers, Kelly Edwards, she was on air with you and she was in lower Manhattan. She was able to give some vivid descriptions of what she saw. When I got down to the World Trade Center, uh, you know, I was standing at the tip of City Hall Park looking up and it was uh, absolutely impossible to comprehend the enormity of the situation. You see what's in front of you, but you can't believe it because it's so much uh, larger than anything you've ever experienced before. And so uh, you talk about the instinct of a news person. The instinct of a, a street reporter is to go straight to the action. I was running to go to the plaza. Uh, I knew exactly where the command post would be. I mean, I'm intimately familiar with uh, the, uh, the World Trade Center but I couldn't go there because there was so much debris falling and it was incredibly dangerous. And so I had to shake myself because th there's no playbook for covering something this, this, uh, this horrible. They don't teach you in journalism school how to do this. I had to shake myself. I stood there. I said, first thing, do not get killed. In my mind, I made a mental perimeter. I said, I'm going to stay back a block from the plaza to ensure my own safety. I said, I can't do any good if I'm dead. And I did that. And um, then I was like, what do I do? Phones didn't work. Communications were knocked out. I had to get to a phone. On Park Row across from City Hall, there was a blimpy base, a sandwich shop. Locked up, the guys in there were petrified. I banged on the door, let me on the phone. I was able to do some reports from there. Then I was just trying to grab people coming out. What's it like inside? What's going on? Just trying to, it, it's your job as a reporter to be a witness to what's happening. So I was just trying to give descriptions. This is what it's like. This is what I see. This is what's good. It was just a cacophony of sirens and screams. There were shoes and briefcases and bags in the street because people dropped what they had and ran for their lives. I would grab a few people and I say, how can I be helpful here? I, I grabbed, I don't know how many people, but I just, where, what's your name? Where are you from? And I said a few names on the radio. John Smith from Rockland County is out and he's, he's heading home. Maybe his family heard it. I hope his family heard it. How could you be useful in that situation? And then I was told uh, to find Giuliani, find the mayor, go to his people. They'll be on Church Street. I went to Church Street. I found one of his press people. I had my back to the Trade Center. I said hi to her. She said hi to me. And then we heard this noise, this rumble, this roar and turned and saw the building pitch and then start to come down and we just ran and we ran and uh too many people in front of us couldn't go north on church street hung a right headed east back toward broadway and it was just this roar and the sound of footsteps and people breathing heavily and hoping and praying that the debris doesn't start to rush past you and wash over you and engulf you and knock you to the ground. I was able to get to Broadway and look down and that's when it blew past St. Paul's Chapel. It went up, it went every direction, it blotted out the sky where we were and chased us. And we had to run to stay away from it. By the time I ran north up to, by the federal building, there was a deli, I went in the deli, 
long lines of people getting water to wash out the debris. I said, give me your phone. They gave me the phone. It worked. I called in and that was the first report I was able to give after the South Tower collapsed. And that report is the only way that my family knew I was not dead because they were all listening on the radio. You talk about being useful, Sean, and I know that was the function that everybody in front of me served that morning, relaying in the kind of information you're talking about. Uh, have we heard from our loved ones? What's going on? Is this attack? Are we being attacked by some foreign nation? What is happening? These are the things that were so vital that day. And uh, Jeff, I, I remember you telling me how it hit you when you were watching a documentary and you could hear people listening to our, our broadcast that morning in the playback. Yeah, we all know on, on like the 9-11 anniversary every year, if you're you know flipping through TV, you'll catch like 10 different shows about 9-11. And I'm just flipping through the TV and I catch one. I don't know who or what it is. I think it was uh, the entire day set to pictures and video that were provided by just people on the street and they synced it up to radio and TV reports. And uh, Pat, there were people on a street corner, I, I think on the west side, just like gathering around somebody's radio that they're holding in their hand and it's our voices coming out and they're all just listening with tears coming down their faces. And it's a perspective that we didn't have because we were on autopilot, but the way that people perceived what we were doing was clearly depicted in this show, and I lost it. I just lost it. I had a friend who told me later, her husband worked, I think, in Rockefeller Center, and he typically drove to work. So everyone was leaving and he was driving up Sixth Avenue with his windows open and every other car had us on. Yeah. Sean, you can't unsee what you saw. The experience that you went through along with everybody else, including so many who were, you know, of course there's the heroes, the other first responders, but you were an information first responder that morning and the trauma was felt universally. Um, do you still carry that weight? Sure, of course. It uh, it never leaves. You know, because um, one of the first thoughts I had when I got down there, I was trying to make a mental list of how many people I knew who would be be in this area at the time, uh, including my sister and her uh, her nine month old daughter. They had just taken the path train from Hoboken to World Trade Center. My sister had a uh, little Ellie in a little uh, backpack thing. She's nine months old. My sister was taking her to daycare in the federal building. By the time she walked from the trade center to the federal building, the first plane had hit. Um, communications were out that day, but I'll tell you, uh, the only text I got that day, I got a, a page. We still had pagers. I had a page from my sister saying she was okay. Uh, but other people I knew, uh, I was like, this person, that person, I hope these people are okay. And sure enough, uh, one of my best friends, his father was was killed. And uh, that never leaves you because I think about them and the family and I think about all the families all the time. And over the years, over 20 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing uh, many families, uh, people of incredible strength, uh, unbelievable uh, just fortitude and the way that they've carried on and they've the common denominator is that many have chosen to do good things moving forward and they help others and their charities and so much good has happened over the past 20 years. That's their way of uh, saying that, uh, that hate, uh, hatred will not win. Tom Kaminsky. Um, I know one of the children of one of the firefighters who raced into to one of the buildings that morning you happen to have in the class you teach, radio production class at Montclair State. You didn't know at the time as you were telling the kids the information and playing them the clips and you gave them fair warning. I know you told me the story. You know, if you have a problem with this, uh, you should know what we're going to be playing for you, the audio of what happened on 9-11 that morning. Uh, that person did not tell you that their father went into the building. What, what happened there? Uh, well, she didn't, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, when I started uh, teaching at Montclair State in, in 2000, uh, 2015, uh, and one thing that I do uh, every semester is I play our 
long form audio uh, for my students. And uh, I want them to hear how it sounded minute by minute as it unfolded. And I did give my students warning that we are this week. If you have, a, and again, this is 2015. Uh, if you have a family member, if you have some reason that you don't want to hear this, let me know and you can opt out and that's fine. No one did. Uh, I played the audio. And as I have now come to do every semester, uh, I, I giving them updates on everyone that they heard in this audio, what they're doing now. And after the class was finished, one of my students came up to me and said, I'm, thank you for playing that. Uh, my father uh, works for the, he's on the FDNY. He, he's a fire for the ladder in the company. And, um, and, and I said, why didn't you say anything to me? I, and, and she said, no, I wanted to hear it because he, he hasn't really talked about it. And I wanted to hear what it sounded like. I wanted to hear what he went through that day. This is something that, you know, we, we, we hear the phrase never forget. And it's very oftentimes correctly associated with 9-11. With but there's an entire generation of, of people for whom that does not apply. And they had not been born yet. My son was born in 2002. So that doesn't apply to him. That generation is now entering college. So that's why I have my students listen in real time, giving them the, the, the not only the backstory of what happened, but letting them hear what essentially is history unfolding in front of them as it unfolded for, for all of us here um, to give them a sense of that. They've all seen the pictures, but they've not heard this audio. And that's one of the things that I, in my way of letting this generation know what happened. The history of 9-11 is a living history. It is a history still being written 20 years later. There is a bill now before uh, the United States Senate. Uh, Senators uh, Menendez and Blumenthal from our area are trying to get the, the government to open up some of the files, some of the intelligence that has been blocked for 20 years now. Uh, particularly as it may involve uh, the Saudis, 15 of the hijackers of the 19 were Saudis, or explain why they can't release that information. Families want to know out of respect to those they lost because for them, this is not over. How do we balance, never forget, with moving on? I think the city and in the country have done that in the sense of the, the memorial and the rebuilding downtown. And there's a place to remember, but it's also a place that continues on as part of the city. You know, as a person who lives outside of New York now, uh, I don't know, through through my radio show and talking about 9-11 as we get to the anniversaries, I've become this weird sort of embodiment of what transpired there because I live in a place where to everybody else, it was something that happened in a little box called a TV. And they all remember where they were when they saw the TV, but the visceral being there, the smell, the ash, the dust, those days afterwards, that's not part of it. And uh, I can't say that they struggle with how to remember it, but as time goes on, I've noticed that it's become a day of public service here. Sign up for your favorite public organization. I'm going to be involved in a, in a pop-up museum outside of Salt Lake City um, that, that's being created just of media clips from that day and they're going to be busing in school children to see it and it's going to be uh, tied to a uh, uh, firefighters we've lost in the past two years event that i'm going to mc and uh, this is how they remember and i'm kind of afraid of walking through this this museum that they're creating as a pop-up for the kids and just like accidentally walking into audio of our broadcast and having to become the old guy who tells the story to those who do not know. And Tommy talking about talking to his broadcast. Is it a broadcasting class, Tom? It is. It, it's a radio production. I mean, class. that day, all of you, who would have thought uh, on that day, 20 years from now, we're going to be part of a broadcasting class. And this is a lesson 
for kids in the future. Wayne, it, it, that, that whole idea of, the, that idea of teaching history that this and this is relatively new because again, just in the from my my first uh, experience in teaching, you did have a number of students that that did have a personal connection or some sort of a at least a memory of this. We're now we're now in that history phase and how you know what do you how do you teach that? And that's another bone of contention too. But if we're talk, talking about remember, you know, never forget and balancing that with moving forward, for me, that's one day at a time. That's it is all for 20 years. It has been one day at a time because we flew past the Twin Towers five, six times a day. Uh, we were not allowed back in the air until about six weeks afterwards, which in, in hindsight was a surprisingly fast uh, amount of time. And ever since then, it has been I focus in on the little events that have gone on the first time we were able to fly again the first anniversary uh when the the last load was 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 pulled out from from there and that last load beam is now prominently displayed in the 9-11 museum the opening and walking through the 9-11 museum um and i i often think about the topping off of of the new building after seeing lower manhattan start to become revitalized that's that's how you move forward it's one little bit at a time and the fact that this is a burden shared by not only of us here in uh, on this broadcast but also anyone who lived through that day that there's comfort in that it's a burden that we shared and it's also something that and it's hard to remember now and how divisive things are but it just brought us all together we were one it's a feeling that i don't think we could possibly impart to kids who weren't around then now, just as they didn't remember 9 11 because maybe they weren't born yet there's no way they could have understood, given today's climate, just how America was united. Sean Adams, I know you had some thoughts you want to pass along. Well, I'll, I'll pick up with that and then I'll, I'll backtrack uh, to, to illustrate just how nice everybody was. Uh, uh, not long ago, I, I caught up with uh, Will Jimeno, Port Authority police officer. Uh, he and his uh, and a sergeant, uh, his sergeant John McLaughlin, they were buried under uh, the pile and they survived and they were dug out and uh, they suffered crippling injuries, but they're both alive. And uh, Will Jimeno is an extraordinary man of strength and he's come out with two books, a children's book and now also a book that just came out about PTSD. But he told this interesting story. For two weeks, he was in the ICU at Bellevue. Okay, he was coughing up chunks of concrete. Uh, his leg had been pierced by steel rebar. I mean, he was his legs were crushed. Uh, and two weeks, he said two weeks, and Bellevue is a trauma center. Not one gunshot wound, not one stabbing. Think about that. For two weeks in, in, in Manhattan, not one gunshot wound, not one stabbing. There was uh, uh, an overall sense of community that uh, I wish we could put in a bottle and sell it and make the world a better place. Going back to you talked about uh, history and also moving forward. Uh, it's not all the past and it's not all history. This is a continuing story and it's still being written. And it, it, one of the chapters is uh, the after effects of being exposed to the toxic uh, dust of the World Trade Center. Uh, the, the federal government estimates more than 400,000 people in lower Manhattan were exposed uh, to a witch's brew of uh, toxic chemicals uh, in the dust, in the smoke, at present, I believe the World Trade Center Health Program is uh, treating either for physical or mental uh, problems 83,000 people. You have more than 20,000 cancer cases associated with that exposure. Uh, you have so many other uh, illnesses uh, related to the lung problems and uh, gastrointestinal problems. Uh, the death toll post 9-11 has exceeded the death toll of the day. More than 4,000 people have died from World Trade Center related illnesses. This is an evolving story that's only going to get worse. And it's part of the larger story, but it's continuing to go on. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that's happening now because we know the latent latency period for a lot of these toxic elements uh, 
it takes time for the for the these things to do their nasty business inside a person's body. So only more people are going to get sick, and that's why the World Trade Center Health Program is there for responders and survivors, people who lived and worked in Lower Manhattan, south of Canal Street. Well, Sean, the depth of what you just pointed out to us there is is just hard to even uh, comprehend, really. Uh, and in the moments after the attack happened, uh, Pat and Jeff, as you were on the air, I, I listened back and I think you were, you were probably about 20, 25 minutes in before you could even bring yourselves to to say what we were all thinking. My God, there are probably people in there and there may be some, some lives lost. We hadn't heard a word from inside the buildings because all communication was cut off. Um, what, when you think back now at just how numbing the entire experience was, um, what are your thoughts knowing what you know now? What you know now about the depth of the suffering, about the all the lives lost, about the Pentagon, Shanksville, all that happened after those initial moments? It was coming at us fast and furious. So we knew even in the moment, not quite the depth of it, of course, but we knew. I remember at one point, I'm looking at the timeline and it's, you know, 846, the North Tower, 903, the South Tower, et cetera, et cetera. And then 937, the Pentagon. And I can remember at one point saying it gets worse and trying to set it up for people who, there's gonna be more bad stuff, I have to tell you. I think we had an inkling because it was just so fast and furious and it was one thing after another. So we had a sense this was pretty widespread and pretty big. And then the towers collapse and then, you know, Shanksville, et cetera, et cetera. It, it was just relentless. It was breathtaking. Can I be honest? I don't think I've ever processed it. It's still a day full of numb, followed by tears. And because I left the New York area, while they were still building the new tower and the memorial, maybe I never got that closure that everybody else did. I don't know, but I'm still choked up now hearing Sean speak about this and hearing Tommy talk about his experience. Tom Kaminsky, Sean Adams, Pat Carroll, Jeff Kaplan, the team that morning, uh, the voices who told you the story that day uh, that so many millions of stunned New Yorkers still feel uh, for whom never forget is more than just a slogan. Thank you all for coming on this morning. Wayne, can I add one thing, please? Just one sure, thing. Sean. Absolutely. I don't, I don't want to let this moment slip away. I think I just want to say one of the most compelling pieces of radio I ever heard, and, and, and I was riveted when I heard it. I didn't recognize her voice when I heard it, uh, but the story is just so compelling. Our uh, veteran City Hall reporter, Mary Gay Taylor, I didn't know it. She was a block south of me. She was a block closer to the Trade Center. She's basically across the street. And when the South Tower collapsed, uh, she had nowhere to go. She couldn't run. Uh, she dove under the bumper of an emergency vehicle and her world went black. It just went completely dark and she thought she was dead. And she inhaled all of that uh, dust and uh, flashlight broke through the darkness and uh, she was led out. She was able to get back to City Hall and get on the microphone and had the composure to tell her story of the collapse and how she survived. Uh, I was, uh, to this day, it's, it sends chills up my spine and I, we, I just want to remember her for that, uh, that amazing piece of reporting amidst such a horrible experience. Very happy you did, Sean, and, and we will leave it there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wayne.